Okay, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this policy lab. So I'm going to present you, I hope this will work. Yes, um, the main results of a um, very recent ESPON targeted analysis about cross-border public services. I say very recent because um, the final report hasn't been validated yet, uh, but we wanted to share with you uh, the ESPON community, the main recommendations and lessons learned from the, from the project. And so you should have received, as Peter told you, uh, um, and maybe read, <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, what we call a draft working paper that summarizes uh, all, all this. And according to our discussions today, and uh, also to your, your, your feedbacks, and you'll feel free to, to, to send us anything uh, within the next, uh, the, the next days if you, if you wish, ESPON will propose and publish uh, um, what we call a policy brief uh, on the subject by the beginning of, um, of next year. So, uh, I, will, uh, I will start with uh, some words about the framework of, uh, of, of the study, then I will explain uh, how uh, we defined CPS and what were the objectives of the project from, from the beginning. Then I show you some maps and figures, um, the main trains at the European level, and we also talk and discuss the, the main challenges and potentials for developing CPS, and eventually we'll conclude with the key messages for policymakers and focusing maybe on, in particular on, uh, on the particular cases of uh, ETC programs, and it won't take us more than two hours, probably. I'm joking, no? Up, I don't know. So, First map. For this project on cross-border public services, we, we received at first a proposal from a consortium of 10 members of uh, the AEBR, led by Region Sonder Jülen Schleswig, it's always complicated for me, yeah? uh, represented here by uh, Peter Hansen, our moderator today. And you can see on the map all the stakeholders' uh, uh, areas, noticing that three of them are related to Austria. And we had, uh, just for information, we had AEBR as a help desk and also the MUT uh, involved in our steering committee. And I would uh, also take this, like to take this opportunity to, uh, to mention the excellent research team uh, we had. It was led by Special Foresight, uh, Kai is over there. And let me thank especially uh, Mrs. Uh, Sabine Tsilma, uh, uh, who was our project manager, who's not with us today, but uh, surely uh, uh, is, she's, all, she's been for some time already a member of the Big Espan community. So let's have a look at this project and that has just been completed a couple of uh, weeks ago. What was the purpose uh, of it from the beginning? Well, considering the existence of a very dispersed information, the first objective was to gather as much data as possible uh, to get an extensive overview of CPS, um, if possible, for all cross-border areas and to identify policy recommendations to support their development. And for 10 border regions, the idea was to propose more in-depth analysis to provide answers to the following questions. What are the territorial needs and the obstacles hampering the development of cross-border public services? According to their local political objectives, what are the needs and potential for adapting existing services or developing new ones? So basically this was the, uh, the idea. Uh, but the first problem we had uh, is that we don't understand the same thing when we're talking about public services. So the first mission was to agree on a definition. And the scope in this case is eventually less important than sharing this definition. So still to give you some, some, some insight and, 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 and the, main, the main figures, we are talking about services. We're not talking about infrastructures. So it means that a bridge crossing a border is not a CPS, a cross-border public service for us. Okay? But the bus bringing people from one side of the border to the other side, then this is a, this is a service and this is considered as a CPS. And also a cross-border public service, a CPS, is not a short-term project or service. Huh? Uh, let's say we have a, fine, uh, a service finance thanks to European funds uh, that stops when funding is terminated. Then we, we haven't considered that as a CPS also. And also CPS are provided or made available by public authorities mainly they address joint problems in a defined cross-border territory. Uh, they generate benefits for a general public or more specific target groups. We'll see that later. And uh, eventually, they may be delivered uh, using existing or uh, newly established bodies or structures. So let's move to the result of the stock taking we made. Up. Here is 
another map. So where are CPS provided in Europe today? Knowing that the project has shown that we're talking about almost 600 identified CPS at the moment. Well, they can be found all over Europe, basically, but they are spread in quite a rather imbalanced way. Um, uh, IS density can be found along borders of, between the oldest member states, if I can say, and also uh, in the Nordic countries. Uh, to give you some, some figures, we have more than 40% of um, identified CPS located along the Benelux borders and France and Germany. Um, there is also an identity of CPS that can be observed along the German Swiss, the French Swiss, the Czech German, and partially the Austrian German also borders and also the Danish-German border. Um, so basically it appears that CPS primarily exists along borders that either have like a long-standing uh, tradition of cross-border cooperation uh, in areas with high density of people and population, uh, where you have a high demand or specific needs for services in any, of any kind, or in contrary, on, in some areas, like in the northern part of Nordic countries, uh, with you, where you have extremely low population densities and long distance between town and villages, but then where you have so many difficulties and high pressure for maintaining public services, then uh, cross border public services then exist. So why do these border regions invest in, in CPS? Because it brings added value, but basically, of course. It contributes to reducing negative border effects, it supports flows, and it contributes to better connections uh, across the borders, and it aims to improve the quality also of existing public services, or also private service provision. That's an important point. Huh? CPS can also compensate a shortage of both public services uh, or, and there again, because we, we, we talked about that yesterday, uh, territory matters. Huh? Uh, we discussed that uh, yesterday, but for CPS also territorial characteristics are typical drivers for, for, for CPS. And there is also one other thing, this is history. history where there is a long-standing cooperation and existing interstate state or regional agreement, conventions, treaty, things like that, then there is a favorable environment for CPS, as you can notice uh, uh, on the map. So the, the, the map basically uh, shows uh, also under what kind of uh, legal, what kind of legal basis were, were, were used for, for CPS, and you, you can have, of course, the umbrella of uh, EU regulation or directive, or multilateral uh, convention, agreements, kind of treaties. Uh, or interstate agreement, but most of the time you have regional and local agreements. Huh? So all the four types are used as basis for CPS implementation, but in many cases there is a combination of, uh, of the four types that, that is applied. Which are the policy areas? Which policy areas are addressed? So you can see the different, in different colors, the different thematics on the map. Um, more CPS today are concerned with environment protection, civil protection, disaster management, transport, things like that. Followed, but, but only followed by special planning, healthcare, or, or education uh, uh, services. So it means also that the, the special distribution of, of the teams is also uneven across Europe, with borders that show clear focus on one topic and others with a, a lot of different, different wide range of, uh, of areas. For example, in the, in the Nordic countries, CPS have a strong focus on civil protection and disaster management, and also on healthcare. If you take the Baltic states, then it will be predominantly concerned with citizenship, justice, public, se public security. If you take uh, some examples like that, Czech, Czech German, Austrian German, then you will have uh, environment protection, rather, or medical emergency care and transport services. And if you take Belgian border, then you have something really interesting uh, about healthcare. If you take British, Irish borders, uh, Germany and Netherlands, etc., then you have other borders where you have a, a right range uh, an array of intervention fields uh, with no specific one uh, overwhelming. So given the, 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 the broad spectrum of this uh, in inventory, we, we, we think that there are good arguments also to say that this distribution also reflects somehow the current policy needs for uh, uh, further uh, or future uh, potentials, uh, CPS development. Target groups, at whom are, are the services targeted? So 
basically CPS can target unspecific as well as very, very specific uh, target groups. But for sure, there's one thing that is sure, that is that we have hundreds of thousands of European citizens that benefit directly from one or several CPS, and that's the most, probably the most important. You see on, on, in the table that 20% uh, is about public authorities, it means <coughs> cooperation between, I don't know, for example, fire brigades, hospitals ac across borders, and then the largest specific target groups are tourists, and, uh, but you, have, you can have also, and we have in identified some really small and specific target groups, as you can see on the, on the table there, and in the document. Uh, one more thing, which is in interesting, it's the, 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 since when there were CPS were uh, operational. You can see that until 1990, only few CPS were developed every year, and since then, it, the number has slowly but steadily, steadily increased. That's quite impressive, and you can see also the special distribution in this series of maps. Not yeah. Not s slowly, I mean regularly. <laughs> regularly, not slowly. <laughs> and there, the special, special distribution, meanwhile. You can see that, okay, to the map. Up. All right, so now some key findings coming from the case studies and also from the selection of uh, good practice examples you have here on the map. So on the ba basis of this analysis, what can we say about potentials for, for, for the future? So in order to give a, 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 an indication for the likeliness for future CPS, we, uh, we launched last year an online survey to complete the, the case studies and the desk research we, we made. So it means that the answers are not totally representative, but, it, and, and we, but we still we collect indication on 49 border, uh, border relations in Europe. So uh, there was still a good diversity of the, uh, of the responses. And what we discovered is that uh, there might be a shift in priorities, in priority thematic areas uh, in, in the near future. You remember, at, at, at the moment, um, uh, CPS are not mainly, I mean, they, they, we have a lot of CPS and, on environment and uh, um, transport and civil protection and things like that. What we see through the responses is that, um, for example, uh, um, question policymakers said that uh, cooperation between uh, cultural, cultural heritage sites or museums are among the fields of interventions where CPS may most likely emerge in the near future. That's one example. The other one is healthcare services. Uh, this is also of particular interest. And what we saw also is that most of the foreseen uh, CPS have not yet been established because of what? Because of legal and administrative obstacles. So these legal and administrative framework conditions are the main obstacles today uh, for the establishment of CPS. Um, it can be like uh, unclear competencies of policy actor, incompatible domestic uh, uh, legislation, uh, even if we have also other kind of, uh, of barriers, mentions like uh, language barriers, social cultural divides, or economic discontinuity between borders. Uh, these obstacles are the main impediment to develop further CPS, even when there is a need that is perceived. So in our case studies, and in our 29 identified uh, good practice examples, we have tried to illustrate uh, mainly what, what we could tailor made practical solutions uh, to, 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 to provide guidance for policymakers to, uh, to address CPS development challenges. And for example, what we say is that uh, we, we should really start CPS development with little formalization as possible and make use when possible to existing cross-border structures rather than inventing and creating new one. But as I said, depending on each specific uh, territorial context, the good Practice examples illustrates also the, the whole variety of available alternatives for managing, financing, and delivering CPS. To sum it up, we can say that uh, CPS provision is possible along any kind of border in Europe as long as there is a common understanding of the framing conditions, needs, and objectives for CPS provision. Then, Depending on, of course, the, the, the context of each border region, several aspects should be uh, considered in the process. Uh, we can give examples such as uh, what task 
to assign it to a specific CPS, what kind of infrastructure do we need, what relevant legal framework can be used, and also what kind of management and organization would be more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. What else? Uh, some, yes, some CPS can be established in some really simple ways. There's nothing to, there's no need to be, uh, to over complexify the, the, the things that no requiring complex cross border bodies with all legal personality, etc. This is not necessary most of the time. Huh? However, it requires commitment to drive the process. It means institutional persistency, clearly. Because CPS usually are voluntary actions huh? uh, of local authorities. It, it, it adds to their everyday business. Huh? So it's really, it's somehow it puts also uh, the, um, every service at risk in, in, in the long term because this is the most important factor. Um, CPS, of course, CPS development needs are starting point, most often from bottom up. Um, so for first, when you launch first pilot action, small scale CPS, the idea really is to try to minimize formalization and only ensure that you have sufficient resources available and of course, a common understanding with your partners. Huh? So because cross-border obstacles will not disappear like that, it requires action and it requires continuity in actions. Across Europe, um, cross-border structures like uh, EGTC, uh, Euro, region, Euro region, things like that, they have different degrees of experience in cross-border cooperation, cooperation and CPS. So they should adjust their roles and activities to the level of existing cooperation in their area. Uh, most of the time, competencies are, of course, different, uh, differently distributed across the, the borders, and that has to be taken into account. And also, uh, one last thing, uh, to develop a CPS, many challenges cannot be solved at local or regional level. Uh, you, you will need higher administrative level to be involved, and it requires also for you to intensify uh, the communication of cross-border needs. So for that, specific cross-border monitoring data, uh, we know that we, we need that, and that's a, 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 a big challenge. Uh, uh, it, it could be really, really useful, and that's not really the, the least important challenge for the, for, for the future. I, I will conclude with some, some, some message focusing at the, uh, at the EU, the EU level, because among others, the EU institutions can pa pave the way for CPS development in the next programming period. Um, in particular, to give the ETC programs the flexibility to better address local and regional challenges, to reducing the administrative burdens for beneficiaries and facilitating more investment in, in, in CPS. What we saw is that all identified solutions for developing a CPS, are, they have the characteristic of interact cross border projects, for sure. And uh, so it, uh, it led us to the, the conclusion that interact can serve as a leverage uh, for durable operation implementation of, of CPS. Um, the success rate of uh, interact projects supporting a CPS development can be increased probably uh, through seed money prior to uh, so the application stage uh, as it can support, uh, for example, the analysis of financial sustainability uh, beyond the, the interact project. And also evidence uh, shows that complementarity, complementary calls uh, within the same programs or across uh, programs covering different uh, priorities and border segments can result in complementary projects that increase the CPS coverage, sectoral and geographical coverage. And eventually, uh, while interact projects are um, the main lever for potential future CPS, different stages of implementation might need different complementary support mechanisms. Um, why interact cross-border cooperation has proven to work well in case of good, practice, uh, uh, good practices, feasibility studies, pilot action, things like that, developing and testing specific solution, especially when it comes to technical or technological one, uh, then it can benefit from other kind of engineering cap capacity, for example, in the context of research and innovation grants, we think. So to conclude, uh, I would like to say that beyond the, the inventory we had now and the compilation of the, of the good practices we, we, we made, this project has showed that increasing awareness about the possibilities and the added values of, of CPS, basically, that, that strengthens uh, cross-border cooperation, and that's probably the most important lesson. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicholas. Are there any questions dealing with the presentation? Maybe some clarifications. 
it seems not to be the case. But of course, I have one very important question. When will we get it? Well, we will get, uh, you, you will get. You have already this document, draft working paper, huh? which I ask you once again uh, kindly to, uh, to provide us with our, your feedbacks, if, if, if you wish. And we will publish a policy brief within the next week and all the reports, documents, guidance, good examples, good practices, etc., will be on the ESPN website probably uh, within uh, the next weeks. Let's say January for sure. So late Christmas gift, maybe. Exactly. Oh, Great. After Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. Natalie. Yes, yeah, sure. But maybe we use a mic. Thank you. Um, I'm Nathalie from DG Regional, European Commission, cross border, Interreg, <laughs> public services, cross border. Um, just a question on the scope of the study. Did you, did you also look at fiscal financial aspects of these services? Because we hear a lot about uh, the difficulties there when we, as the Commission, try to encourage um, public authorities in particular to look at the potential of developing cross-border services. And the second question would be, without anticipating my intervention a bit later, um, you mentioned obstacles of a legal or administrative nature. Does the document also contain a list of these obstacles or have you been able to identify some of these obstacles in the case studies? Uh, and if so, do we have scope to look at um, the regulation that the Commission, the draft regulation the Commission has tabled on the cross-border mechanism? Do you think there is scope for us to work on that together? To, to answer the last question, yes, uh, all case studies and also more generally the, 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 the study provides a clear description of obstacles uh, that we found uh, along the project and along the different kind of, uh, of, of thematics and, 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 and CPS uh, identifies. You have that uh, in, the, in all the documentations and, um, and, and obviously the, the, the the potential new mechanism proposed in the, in the regulation by the Commission is also mentioned as one of the key points of, uh, of the policy recommendation. And your first question was about uh, fiscal. and fiscal. So, um, financial and fiscal um, dimension was, was clearly identified as one of the main topics, but it was not developed as such in this project, and this is one of the potential future dimension of future research. Mm -hmm. 